<laughs> anthropologists have determined that not all people know the best way. Okay? So the, um, you don't have to know that that's true. No chimp knows the true. So the uh, so that they wind up with children as a result of, of mating behavior, but perhaps the uh, that's what that would commonly be, be what would happen. And then of course they have those relationships, and those are extremely valuable. Those are in fact the vessels of their genes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they don't have to compete for those relationships. Those relationships just happen. There are three relationships that they seek and that they must compete for, okay? And those relationships are mates, friends, and trade partners. Now, it's gonna be the case that over here, I call this Cal, John, and whatever. Here's these five, five guys in the Stone Age over here. And uh, one of them has a hearing. Okay, now, so the thing is, is here's, here's Horace over here, okay? He's a good, solid guy. Now, our, our gal, Joni, here, here may want to marry Horace, but Horace might say, well, I'm not so sure I want to marry you. Why? Because I might have competitors over here. Okay? You've got competitors over here, Joni, and I'm going to check out those competitors uh, before I make a decision. Okay? Now, so her nervous system is designed by nature to, to have to be concerned with the competitive problems of mating. And um, so inside of her head, we look inside of that brain, we would find a huge chunk of that brain would be all involved about the problems of competition. Now, in fact, there's a good reason to believe that about two thirds of the tissue of the brain is involved with these problems. And now, the, um, why wouldn't it be? What else does it have to give? Okay, it already solved all the problems of the ecological challenges of Sub-Saharan Africa when it had 450 cc's when it was the size of a chip spray. What happened in the last two million years? It went from 450 cc's to about 1,300 cc's. Why? Why would it triple in size? Where was the great complicated survival challenge that wound up needing to have a massive amount of brain tissue in order to solve it? If there was such a complicated, massive survival problem, some new fancy alligator that could trap people, that had to figure out its way around it, if there were such a thing, how come the chimps didn't have the same problem, and how come they didn't grow their brain three times the size? Brain tissue is only going to grow according to two different problems that, it, that the genes have, either survival problem or a reproductive problem. If it's a survival problem, you see what we call convergent evolution. All of these related organisms in the environment have to adapt, and the same genes wind up solving the same problems. That's why if you go up to the Arctic, you're going to find a bunch of animals with a bunch of thick fur. Because they've all got the same survival problem that they've got to solve. Okay? But when you see one animal out of a group of related animals, and only it has that characteristic, you can bet your last dollar that the reason it has that characteristic is for me. That's solving the mating problem. Now, so human beings solve their mating problems by getting a massively bigger brain. Let's figure out what that brain is for. Okay. Well, for one thing, it's got it's obviously happening under competition. That brain is being selected to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's worried about competitive problems. And so she is worried about this, and we're going to now watch this because I'm going to explain that what she seeks through all these relationships is what we're going to call esteem. Okay? That she wants to be esteemed or valued. And okay? this is what, that, what human beings seek because values, uh, evaluation means that you are being preferred. Okay? That you have a, you know, there's a list of potential competitors. And those competitors have differences in how it is much that they're valued by other uh, by trading potential trading partners, and therefore there's a competitive process that's involved here, and um, and therefore you got to be worried about the competitive process. So you uh, you're trying to figure out how it is to get more competitive, and we call that esteem. That's the word that we use. We could also use the word status, but when I use the word status, it turns people off. 
So a couple of years ago, I realized, wait a second, esteem is a nicer word. And if I use that word, I get less cognitive dissonance in people that are listening to this. Okay? So that's the word of the day. It's esteem. It turns out it's going to be very convenient uh, as we uh, explain human psychology further and confusion that these evolved psychologists today. So people seek esteem. She seeks to be esteemed or valued by potential mating partners. Okay? When she is esteemed by mating partners, when they give her good feedback, it creates a mood of happiness. Okay? That happiness has some characteristics to it. We could call it confidence, a feeling of being accepted, a feeling of being valued, etc., etc. Uh, i.e. being attractive. What does attractive mean? It means that other individuals have their nervous systems wanting to close the distance between them and you. That they feel compelled to use energy to get closer to you. That's what attractive is. Unattractive is, is that they feel a, a motivation to move away from you. Okay? So she gets feedback that she's accepted, attractive, etc. That causes a mood of happiness. It should, since it's a signal that you're, you are in better command of the competitive issues and that you can now compete better for mates. Well, why? If you just have one mate, doesn't that just do it? Absolutely not. Because mates have differences in terms of, how, of, of their mate value. And how, how, do they, how do we know this? Well, it's very simple. Well, it's actually extremely complicated. But we know that it's simple. Aristotle said that, you know, what is the purpose of beauty? Only a person without eyes could ask this question. Okay? We now know, 2,000 years later, that what people are doing is they're picking up mutation bugs. That we all carry around about 300 mutations that are negative. And the more mutations a person is carrying, the less attractive they are psychologically and physically. Okay? So you use your assessment of personality, you watch people's behavior, their emotional expressions, you listen to how they talk, you figure out how their mind works, and you watch their appearance from all angles, and you look at all those things and you're coming up with a guess of their mutation rate. Okay? And so Joni is competing, let's suppose that she's seven in the village. She's not competing with the tennis. She knows damn well that she's not going to be hitting on the handsome high school quarterback who is at the top of the gene pool for low mutation loads. He's also speaks three languages and is on the chess team. Okay, we're just gonna go ahead and make this guy a superstar. So we do that and we know that he's only got two, 200 mutations. He's extremely rare, okay? Most likely to succeed. Why do we even do that? Everybody's looking at the genes, everybody casts their little vote, everybody. How many real mysteries when it came to mating decisions when you guys were in high school did you really see? How many tens did you ever see going with a five? How many threes did you ever see going with an eight? I never saw anybody that far off. Everybody I saw made a lot of sense to me. And when they weren't making a hell of a lot of sense, I was a little bit puzzled, i.e. an eight and a five. Whoa, what's going on there that I don't know about? See what I'm saying? So human beings are watching, they are competing, and she has competitors right at her level that are competing ferociously for the guys that are in the seven to eight range. Okay? She's got competition. So she's got neurological equipment that makes her keen to try to look for feedback that indicates when she is doing things that increase her cachet or decrease her cachet. So she's highly sensitive to feedback. Okay? This is going to be what we call an esteem meter. Because an esteem meter inside of her head, when the meter gives her positive feedback, it causes a mood of happiness of a specific type. When it's negative, it causes insecurity, unhappiness, sad, anxiety. All these are these are all signals that are indicate threats to her competitive position. Okay? I want to point out that, that should be no different in style than any businessman that just opened up a shop. He gets a bunch of people wanting to trade with him. His esteem meter feels great. He's got moods of happiness. He's feeling confident. He's feeling valued. It feels like his goods in his store is attractive. It's great. Okay? 
Somebody open, a competitor opens up down the street, same widget, everybody starts going there, and now how does it feel? Anxious, sad, unhappy, insecure, in trouble. Same guy, he's offering the same stuff. There's nothing that has changed about his level of abilities. The only thing that changed was his competitive position in the workplace. Okay? Yeah. So we've got an esteem meter inside of our head. Now, we also have the same meter that's going on with respect to friends. Because we're designed by nature to seek friendships. And those friendships are incredibly valuable. The, um, uh, they're so valuable that it becomes the fabric of human life. Uh, human beings uh, are much tighter together than other animals typically are. Uh, for the reason, there's got to be a reason for it. Isn't it just we're just nice and that that's how we are? Uh -uh. There's got to be a biological reason for it. How come the gorillas aren't so nice? Okay. The thing is, the human beings have the capacity to help each other in ways that a lot of animals can't. So if you've got a couple of gazelle on the Africa savanna that run side by side all day long with each other, and then one of them sticks foot in the snake hole and breaks it, the other one can't help. There's nothing that I can do for you, George. Your leg's broken. Here comes the cheetah. There's nothing I can do. <laughs> so therefore, there's no reason for me to have the psychological equipment to care. If there's nothing I can do about it, there's no reason to have this fancy equipment and motivation to try to figure out how to help you, because I can't help you. 